Hi, I'm Eric Topol, Editor-in-Chief of Medscape, and I'm really delighted today to welcome Tom Insel, who's one of the leading neuroscientists, uh, psychiatrists, and has done a, a remarkable uh, career a trajectory of changing the face of how we approach the mind. And I thought maybe we'd start. Tom, welcome. Um, and uh, maybe kind of how you got into the space of, uh, of behavioral science and you know, maybe back to the origins of what, what you, I think we're at BU, is that right? I uh, went to medical school, interested in neuroscience and, um, gosh, you know, the biology of the mind. Uh, incredibly interesting topic, but that was in the Middle Ages, a long time ago. <laughs> uh, late Pleistocene, to be precise. And uh, as I got uh, into training, trying to decide what I wanted to do, uh, psychiatry seemed like a great way to pursue that. I kind of got there too early. I mm. think I was about 20 years before my time. I'll blame my parents for that, um, but they, they couldn't wait and I couldn't either. So uh, had I been born quite a bit later, it would have been a better match. But for me, <laughs> we just, you know, there just weren't the tools in the late uh, 1970s, early 1980s to be able to try to make that bridge between brain and mind. So you uh, eventually, um, I guess with some influence of others, uh, mentors, you wound up setting up a, a behavioral uh, health science center at Emory? Yeah, so I uh, dropped out of psychiatry pretty quickly after about five years of clinical research, um, which was good. It just, I think I had hit the wall for what I could do and where I could go. So moved into uh, becoming a neuroscientist, retrained, retooled, did a sabbatical at Hopkins, then mm, built my mm. own lab at the NIH. In those days, <laughs> you could get your own lab uh, with almost no credentials. Uh, incredible, that, that would never happen today. But it was a great gift, and uh, uh, NIH, NIMH leadership, uh, very generous. Let me uh, get started, make a lot of mistakes, uh, but through the generosity of great postdocs and a few students, I actually found my way to uh, I, uh, what I think was a, a wonderful career as a behavioral neuroscientist studying uh, the biology of social behavior, attachment, uh, aggression, uh, looking at a whole, a whole series of questions about um, what areas of the brain are important for separation and attachment. Now, when did you get into the whole oxytocin, vasopressin axis? Yeah, right there. I was at the NIH in the 1980s and uh, uh, somebody told me at that point, it's actually a pretty good uh, sort of guidance, they said, you know, it's really easy to make a great career in science. Just two things you have to do. You have to work on something really important, and you have to work on something nobody else is working on. And so, <laughs> Good advice. At that point in time, uh, there was nobody interested in the biology of complex social behaviors. In fact, everybody told me I was making a huge mistake to do that, that uh, you never get anywhere doing that. Um, we just kind of lucked into finding oxytocin and vasopressin and then some really interesting animal models, uh, voles and monogamous mm -hmm. mice and a bunch of animals that really nobody else who did molecular biology was studying at that time and, um, and got started that way and, and uh, fell into this. Uh, at first, uh, nobody seemed to care about it and then all of a sudden uh, everybody thought it was really pretty cool uh, because it was, it was certainly a, a novel approach. And, um, you know, in those days, people had never heard of oxytocin yeah. and vasopressin. And the idea that there were peptides and systems in the brain important for connections between people and social behavior, that was like completely taboo. Uh, but gradually it got to be accepted and then I figured it was time to move on. <laughs> well, it's actually amazing today just to reflect how that still goes on, the, the path about oxytocin and yeah. social behavior, there's, there's papers coming out all the time that advance the remarkable work you did. Now, you went from Emory back to the NIH to, to run the, the Institute of Mental Health and, what that, and actually had a really long stretch there, almost 13 years yeah. or so. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about that part of your career. Well, I had, so I had been at the NIMH, uh, and that's where I really started my neuro, both clinical research and neuroscience career. When I got into this area, area of doing the neuroscience of complex behavior, NIH, NIMH, the intramural part where I worked, was shifting gears, really moving into molecular biology. I was working more at a kind of cellular behavioral level. And um, I was, it was made very clear to me that the work I was doing was not the work that the Institute was gonna invest in. So I was um, rather quickly and not quite politely let go. I was fired. Um, and then oddly enough, uh, eight years later after a stint at Emory and setting up a big NSF center and a bunch of other things, 
I came back as the director of the same <laughs> institute. Uh, uh, Elias Zerhouni, who recruited me, who was then the head of NIH, um, asked me about that and, um, and what it was like coming back. I said, you know, I'm leaving, I'm coming back the same way I left, which was fired with enthusiasm, which I think is pretty accurate at the time. I came back and instead of doing basic science, I wanted to get back into being a doc and thinking that, you know, after 20 years away from psychiatry, neuroscience had grown a lot. And now the opportunity was there between the revolution in genomics, the revolution in imaging, our increasing understanding of, of neural circuits, and our ability to study uh, both mouse, monkey, and human brains, um, that maybe the time had come to actually go to do that mm. original mission of trying to build that bridge between brain and mind. Maybe we could finally do that. So it took 13 years to kind of, you know, move, move the cheese within the institute and yeah. to um, try to get people thinking about this in a deep way. Uh, but I think it was a spectacular period. And well, the we saw so much happen. I, I mean, I watched the influence you had with respect to really emphasizing genomics and, and um, you know, the, the work on things like obsessive compulsive disorder and so many things that you, of course, and supported throughout the, the nation in terms of a whole new approach to, to mental health. But one of the questions I had there was along the way you challenged the psychiatric community with the DSM. Yeah. So for those who don't know, can you just say what was what is the DSM and then what was what was yeah. really why was it really off track? Well, so you know, I I think a, a real problem for psychiatry has been the lack of biomarkers, and our diagnostics have been built upon mostly you know subjective reports uh, and then a consensus that with master clinicians getting together and voting on what are the criteria that make that we should used as classifiers for major depressive disorder, for PTSD, for, you know, but there was never really any biology in this process or really any kind of objective measures other than the consensus. Yeah. Um, I have to say that worked really well. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I was around before we were doing that. So this at least gave us a dictionary, right? It had, we gave us a common language in which every term was defined. And that was a huge, Mm. kind of progress. Mm. So in 1983, and I was part of that original process uh -huh. when we did this, it was, it transformed the field. But by 2010, yeah. we should have been able to do a little better than that. Um, and my concern was that we were putting out yet another edition of the same manual without having really change the paradigm at all. No, it didn't go over that well, I guess, right? Uh, I think it was, yeah, it was definitely contentious. Yeah, I, yeah, you know, that's I what I mean. That, you were challenging the status quo right. and all this stuff, right? Yeah, I mean, the, but to be clear, I didn't have anything better to offer. Right. All I said was, guys, you know, rather than doing another edition, I get it. You need the yeah. money. It's an APA, you know, publication. And I get that there's a value in doing that. And it's like yeah, any other product. You got to revise it every now and then to... Like getting a new iPhone, right? It's okay. This yeah. is a great way to bring in some additional revenue. But let's, let's be honest about it. In terms of where we're at, we, do st we still, you know, 25 years later, don't have the data we need to be able to do this in a more objective, scientific way. And why don't we do that, right? So we set up this thing called the Research Domain Criteria Project, which was not a replacement for DSM. It's just a framework for mm. research to say, this is the kind of data we're going to need if yeah. we want to be able to revise the way we do diagnostics. And by the way, until we fix the diagnostic system, we're probably not going to be able to fix the therapeutics here. Mm, We've got to get mm, this right. Yeah. So that led to this uh, great debate, I think, within the field. Uh, I've been actually uh, mostly reassured that I think most people have said, yeah, uh, this oh, I, is a problem. I, I think over the time, it's been at least a few years, uh, that it, there's been a wide acceptance that you made the right call there. And now the question is, you know, how to get there. And so eventually you, you said, okay, I've done enough, I guess, at NIH. You went um, to Verily and, uh, and now to uh, run um, MindStrong Health. So tell us about this this last, this current phase of your career. Yeah, so, so this is really interesting, Eric. I mean, I, I, I came in with the bias that we could fix the diagnostic problem with, with genomics and imaging. And I was wrong. I mean, we spent a lot of money on both of those topics. 
And at the end of the day, there wasn't really any evidence, maybe a little evidence, but it was not the transformative technology that we would have hoped in the way that it had been for heart disease and it had been for some neurological diseases and the way it was for a lot of other parts of medicine. We just weren't getting the specificity and the clarity and, that we and, would have thought. And that, besides sequencing and functional MRI, were there other tools that you kind of said that they didn't really do it? They didn't provide the, the critical elements well, before it, you, it, we get to the sensors and the, and yeah, the new biomarkers? Uh, yeah, I th well, those are the two main ones. Okay. Yeah, we, we certainly, you know, we went after a little bit with the EEG, but mostly yeah. it was going to be imaging, which was, gosh, transformed. I mean, we got so much further on the technology in those 10, 15 years after the year 2000. And, and certainly genomics was obviously you know, yeah. revolutionized. It turns out that it's not, you know, the, the uh, complexity of those genomic signals and those uh, connectomic signals was no less than the complexity of what we were seeing okay. in the patients in the clinic. So mm. that's when I began to think, uh, you know what, maybe we actually need to get the phenotype right here. Maybe mm, the mm. genotype, we're not even ready to know what genotype that's to look for because we don't have, we don't have the behavior right yet and we don't have the cognition right. So uh, there was also a parallel revolution in cognitive science that hadn't gotten much attention from clinicians. So bringing that, bringing the sensor data, bringing the kinds of things we can do with, um, with smartphones and getting a real picture of what ecological behavior looks like uh, in a continuous way. So rather than just seeing people once a month and having them fill out a form, which by the way doesn't work very well. <laughs> there's no reason to think that that's any more valid than just guesswork at this point. So getting real data in the real world, it's possible. In an odd way, you know, I've always been saying that science often progresses because of better tools. Um, and the better tool for us wasn't, as it turned out, the the 7T MRI machine it was the smartphone, which <laughs> every one of us has in our pockets. Right. It's very powerful computers collecting an enormous amount of information on us. And simply by using that and saying, all right, what are those signals that are going to be important for detecting the beginning of mania, the beginning of depression, the beginning of psychosis? We can maybe this way, mm -hmm. we can begin to actually fix the diagnostic pathway uh, and get much better outcomes. You know, so early on, before you know, I even heard of MindStrong, there were uh, companies like Ginger.io, and they were just basically, what are you texting, what are you voice mm -hmm. sending, yeah. uh, where, how much physical activity movement do you have? But now you've taken it, uh, that, that particular smartphone a potential hub of data to a whole nother level with uh, understanding the keyboard interactions with a person. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so so we call this digital phenotyping. Yeah. It's kind of the term of art. I think it's a good way to describe three things. It is the stuff that Ginger.io and many other companies and a lot of academics have worked on, the sensors. Sensors would be accelerometer, GPS, metadata about social networking kinds of stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Probably not that specific, doesn't look that robust. Right. Second area that's super interesting is capturing voice and speech. Profound insights there mm. about Parkinson's, about early dementia, about capturing aspects of depression and mania, all of which confess themselves through changes in voice and speech. MindStrong is really focused on a third area that I don't think anybody else has executed on in quite the same way, and that is human computer interaction. How do we how do we actually attack the keyboard and the scroll, the space between, uh, or the latency between hitting the uh, space and hitting a character or going to delete, delete, or any of those things that we do and looking at how that changes over time. And remarkably, because there's so much data yeah. about this every time we use our phones, that's beginning to give us a really critical insights into cognition, into mood, into aspects of behavior. Again, in the real world, in a continuous way, highly objective, and it may be actionable. That may turn out to give us yeah, a set so of biomarkers. It's really extraordinary. And now, there's many other ways to get to a person's uh, digitizing their mind, so to speak, mm -hmm. whereby you could, for example, look at their vital signs or their uh, facial recognition, their change right. and expression, and how do you think this is all going to evolve? Are we going to be a multimodal 
strategy to really try to understand a person, particularly if they have a history or uh, potential uh, concerns about their mental health? Yeah, I, I think it will be multimodal. And I think what we've seen both on the biomarker diagnostic side and on the intervention side has been a series of silos. And so no one has tried to bring them all together. And no one's created a kind of learning health system where you close the loop and you capture both this very uh, rigorous assessment tool and you, you put the interventions in on the same form factor. So you're doing interventions continually, whether those are psychotherapy or peer support or crisis intervention or all the things you can do on a phone. At the same time, you're doing the assessment and you're closing mm -hmm. that loop and figuring out what's working, what isn't, how to, how to basically titrate the dose of the yeah. therapy that you're giving. The opportunity there is enormous. Yeah, well, you know, the, the thing that is so extraordinary to me is we have such a big mental health burden and we have really no way to ante up uh, with the people that have the training and the capabilities. And it seems like we need to, uh, to really rally here to get these other tools to help. Now, depression being the number one form of disability in our society, really, do you, do you think that ultimately through not just the digital phenotyping that you've been describing, but also the other types of interactions with, whether it's chatbots or whether it's with, you know, other ways of um, using technology that we'll be able to start to really uh, deal with this uh, very poor matchup of the needs uh, as well and the support. It's a great question. I think we've got to be honest that we don't know. I think there's a lot of hype about yeah, what we're doing yeah. with, uh, with digital tools, and it's, it's very cool to talk mm. about. But whether it will work in the real world of healthcare, for instance, you know, we've got some pretty good evidence that when people get depressed, they stop charging their phones. Good luck there. Right. Like, that doesn't help you no. on either the assessment or the intervention side. Interesting. Um, really so, interesting. So we've got to, we've really got to prove that. And I think it's, there's an urgent question, right? Because the burden is high. The, the needs are extraordinary. And nobody likes the system we have now. Nobody right. wants. Oh, no, gosh. No. Nobody wants the, either the, the DSM, if you want to think of that as the problem. <laughs> or the medications or the therapies, people don't like what we are currently selling. Yeah, no, so, no question um, about to that. to come up with something that's better and maybe something that's actually more user-friendly, where people have more agency, mm. I think that could be super interesting. But we have to remember that unlike diabetes and heart disease and so many other areas of chronic illness, depression is a really tough customer because a, a fundamental aspect of depression is that you're helpless and hopeless, and it kind of gets in the way of you're actually doing the things you need to do to get better. Yeah. And it's that catch-22 which is really tough to solve. So well, You're bringing up such a critical point, yeah. and no less the fact that the, the, the mood and state of mind interacts with all the other conditions of man. So this it. is such a central thing. Now, one of the things that came by surprise in recent years was the idea that you could talk to an avatar or a machine, and you would actually feel more at ease revealing your innermost secrets than talking to another human. Uh, do you believe that? And do you think that's going to actually be used in the future? Uh, what, what do you think? Well, I think we're still learning about that. I mean, all of us are already doing this. You know, when we, we are dealing with bots, yeah. even when we don't know about it, uh, we're dealing with bots right. uh, much of the time. And we, I think we'll come to find it more acceptable. You know, if there's one area of medicine where you would assume that the human interaction is going to be fundamental, it's psychiatry. You would you'd, think. You'd think that yeah. people need to talk to another person. But I uh, hasten to point out that uh, I was trained as a psychoanalyst, and what we were taught to do was to become a blank screen, a, a bot, if you will. Uh, so, you know, we would uh, have people sit on the couch not facing us, uh -huh. and uh, we were told never to say anything that would reveal anything about ourselves so that the patient could develop a whole series of fantasies and projections about us huh. that then would become the basis of the therapy. Um, 
maybe that's what we're going to end up well, that doing. Par that parallel is fascinating, really. Yeah, in a really interesting way, we've now got avatars that really are a blank screen. They, yeah. Really, yeah, <laughs> they really. are what Freud had always wanted to, to create. Uh, and the other thing about them, of course, which is extraordinary, is that um, they can learn, and they don't have any bias built in if they're trained in the right way. Uh, and uh, the opportunity to get this at scale. We're never going to have enough master clinicians. But let's just say, I mean, if we could develop a tool, for instance, that would help us um, to take volunteers on a suicide hotline and give them the skills of a master clinician for detecting suicidal risk, I think that'd be fantastic. Yeah, so no you could question. scale this up yeah. and, and you could do it in real time. You could imagine you know, interpreting the voice and speech of people who call in and giving a red light, a red light green light, yellow light, or yellow light to, to um, college students who are on the, on the line, giving them the skills like you would do, you know, the same way that Waze helps uh, uh, a new driver oh, in the city uh, navigate the way a, a master cabbie would have done it in sure. years past. Sure. So when we think about bots and we think about AI and we think about the to tools we could build it's, yeah, I think it's not so much to replace people, it's to replace tasks and to upskill people, giving them something like the skills of a master clinician without the training that has to yeah. go into that. I think the Waze model for clinical care is actually pretty exciting and we could do it here yeah. um, it, even in the short term. I think the technology at this point is ready to go. Well, I like that Waze model term and I think uh, the, the insights you bring are really quite extraordinary. It's been just a, such a delight to talk to you about this and hoping, uh, being optimistic, that some of these tech uh, tools will help support a, a better model uh, over the years ahead, never supplanting the importance of human to human interactions, but hopefully, as you say, making it a lot better. It's certainly a really big issue that needs to be addressed. So I want to thank all of you for uh, tuning into our conversation. It's been fascinating to have a chance to have this uh, uh, conversation with Tom Inso, one of the leaders in this whole field. And we'll look forward to all the efforts that you have in Mind Strong Health and everything else you'll be doing in the whole field of behavioral science. Thanks very much, Tom. Thanks, Eric.